Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. You're listening to the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. Hello, I'm Oliver Conway. This edition is published in the early hours of Tuesday, the 19th of March. The US and Israeli leaders speak for the first time in more than a month amid concern over Israel's planned assault on Rafah. Israel has not presented us or the world with a plan for how or where they would safely move those civilians, let alone feed and house them and ensure access to basic things like sanitation. We also hear about fears of famine in Gaza. Donald Trump's lawyers say he can't raise the almost half a billion dollars he needs to appeal against a fraud judgment. And Pakistan confirms it's carried out airstrikes inside Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. Also in the podcast, the Gambia votes to bring back female genital mutilation. This practice has done nothing to any woman's body. And this is something that has been performed since pre-colonial era up to date. And people are wholeheartedly willing that this practice should be done. And the cash points in Ethiopia giving out too much money. The US has traditionally been Israel's strongest ally, but the Israeli military offensive against Hamas in Gaza is stretching ties to the limit. On Monday, for the first time in more than a month, the US President Joe Biden spoke to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu by phone. The US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said they had discussed the planned Israeli offensive on the southern Gazan city of Rafah. More than a million people have taken refuge in Rafah. They went from Gaza City to Khan Yunus and then to Rafah. They have nowhere else to go. Gaza's other major cities have largely been destroyed. And Israel has not presented us or the world with a plan for how or where they would safely move those civilians, let alone feed and house them and ensure access to basic things like sanitation. Jake Sullivan. Earlier, a UN-backed assessment said that mass deaths were imminent in Gaza as a result of famine. Our correspondent in Jerusalem, Mark Lowen, told us more about that. But first, I got his assessment on the conversation between the two leaders. Well, it comes amidst a, a period of real acrimony between the two governments, Solly. I mean, last week, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer in the US in effect called for Netanyahu's replacement, calling him an obstacle to peace. And President Biden then endorsed Chuck Schumer's remarks. So the relationship between the two men who've known each other for decades is at a very low level. I mean, Jake Sullivan today said that the conversation was businesslike. It did not end abruptly, he said. But he was clear that Israel's government needs to do much more on the humanitarian front needs to present a much more credible plan if it is going to move into Rafa in order to evacuate some 1.4 million people there. And interestingly, he also said that Israel has said it would send an interagency team, as he put it, to the US to discuss the Rafa operation. So that suggests that the Israeli government is very determined to push into Rafa against all the international warnings of what that would mean, but also that it recognises that there needs to be more preparation before that happens. And Jake Sullivan also said that those suggestions that Gaza could soon be hit by a famine were alarming. Um, What more can you tell us about the details of that? Yeah, this was a report that um, was backed by several UN bodies and aid agencies, which said that unless the humanitarian situation is turned around, unless the fighting is halted, northern Gaza, there would be officially a declaration of famine by the end of May. A fifth of the population faces uh, really catastrophic food insecurity, that uh, one in three children are severely, acutely malnourished. So that gives you a sense of just how disastrous the situation is in the north. And the report also said that 1.1 1.1 million people are now facing catastrophic food insecurity and that is a very extremely high level that has only been surpassed by Somalia and South Sudan in in, um, in the last decade or so. Israel has been criticised from all quarters today over that. The EU's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, said that Israel was using starvation as a weapon of war in Gaza. Israel has consistently said that it is Hamas that is disrupting the aid distribution effort, but frankly it has been very clear that Israel has been holding 
building up aid deliveries by, by land. It has limited the entry points of trucks going into Gaza. It has performed extremely cumbersome checks on trucks. I think the basic message is that Gazans are, are dying of starvation. And briefly, um, the significance of the fact that Israel has again attacked a Shifa hospital in, in northern Gaza. This is Gaza's largest hospital that Israeli forces attacked back in November, saying that it was used as a Hamas command centre. They've now launched another raid Monday morning, and they say that they killed Hamas's head of internal security, who was armed inside. They detained 80 people. If this is confirmed, the death and, and you know, the fighting there would suggest that Hamas is regrouping in the north, which was an area that Israeli troops had largely pulled out of, which is pretty bad news for the Israeli military and suggests that their war aims are simply just not going according to plan. Mark Lowen in Jerusalem. Over the past few days, meanwhile, the Houthis in Yemen have again targeted merchant shipping in the Red Sea. The flow of trade has been seriously disrupted by their drone and missile strikes, which began after Israel's assault on Gaza. The US and Britain have sent warships, but they have failed to stop the Houthi attacks. The American fleet is led by the aircraft carrier, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, which has been targeting the Houthis for more than four months. Our defence correspondent, Jonathan Beale, has been on board. The USS Dwight D. Eisenhower has been launching dozens of sorties with its F-18s day and night for more than four months now. The jets on board tell the story of what they've been doing. The tally of the bombs they've dropped and drones they've shot down painted on the side of cockpits. Their mission has been to protect merchant vessels in the Red Sea, a key trade route. Several cargo ships have already been hit by Houthi drones and missiles. But US and coalition warships are being targeted too. Captain Dave Rowe, the commander of US Navy destroyers, which are part of the carrier strike group, says it's been the most challenging operation in recent US naval history, with the Houthis using increasingly sophisticated drones. This is deadly stuff. This is the most since World War II. Easily. But the most intense? Oh, very much so. You know, ballistic missiles, anti-ship cruise missiles, UAVs, now USVs or underwater vessels. And the game is all out there, and we've been doing this for almost four months now. The overall carrier strike group commander, Rear Admiral Miguez, says the Houthis are not acting alone. He says Iran is providing them with both weapons and intelligence. American and British coordinated airstrikes have already destroyed some of the Houthis' arsenal, but they've not been deterred. And these remain extremely dangerous waters. Jonathan Beale reporting from the Red Sea. Donald Trump prides himself on his business acumen, but it seems the former US president may not be as good with money as he makes out. His lawyers say he can't access the funds he needs to appeal against a fraud judgment, which is for overinflating the value of his properties. Our New York correspondent Neda Taufik has the details. A bond company takes on the responsibility for any payout if a defendant loses on appeal and is unable to pay. According to Donald Trump's lawyers, obtaining a bond has proven to be a practical impossibility after approaching roughly 30 such companies. Very few, they say, will even consider giving him a bond of that magnitude, and the others will not accept real estate as collateral. Mr. Trump had previously asked the court to be allowed to post a $100 million bond while he appeals against the judgment, but that was rejected. Prosecutors argued that there was a significant risk that without a full bond, Mr. Trump would attempt to evade enforcement of the judgment after an appeal. If he is not granted a pause and truly does not have the cash to secure a bond, then the Attorney General Letitia James could potentially ask the judge to start seizing his assets. Neda Taufik. Banks are not famous for their generosity, so you can imagine the surprise and delight of people in Ethiopia when Cashpoint started allowing them to withdraw huge sums of money, more than they had in their accounts. Ethiopia's largest commercial bank lost more than $40 million. It blamed a systems glitch and is trying to get the money back. Kalkidan Yibeltal in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa has the story. 
Well, it happened late into the night and early in in the morning. So what we understand is at that time, after word got out that you know the cash machines are giving this money, people were you know calling each other out on their phones and then texting on different messaging apps, and they were forming these long queues, and they were withdrawing large am- amounts of money. At one point. You know, we were told in a university campus the students were getting so much money until police arrived in the area and stopped them. And do we know what caused this? Well, details are sketchy. Uh, first, the assumption was there was some sort of a cyber attack or hacking to breach the system. But the central bank, they said that there was no cyber attack. There was no hacking. It was a system glitch that happened during maintenance. It lasted for hours. During that time, it seems that they have lost quite a large number of money. Yeah, I mean, will the bank be able to get that money back? And, and what might happen to those who've taken it? They said that they have formed a task force aimed at getting this money. Most of these incidents happened in different university towns and university campuses. So the universities themselves were posting these notices saying that anyone in the university that took the money out should return it voluntarily. The bank's president uh, earlier today gave a statement saying that anyone who is returning the money voluntarily will not be charged. But it's not clear how much that will be successful. And there were uh, reports that they were trying to freeze some of the accounts in which uh, these transactions were made. Yeah, quite embarrassing for the bank. What are people there saying about it all? It's been the, the story of the day. It's been all over social media and many people have been talking about it. And the bank uh, first was rather reserved. They were just simply apologizing for any uh, service interruption that, that may have occurred in their attempts to control this. But later on, they admitted that there was indeed withdrawal of uh, or transfer of money. So it seems that they are trying to control the narrative and as well as trying to return the money. Talgadan Yubaltel in Addis Ababa. Uruguay already generates some 90% of its power from renewable sources. Now it's looking to make green hydrogen for use as fuel using renewable methods. But a severe drought and concerns about water supplies have sparked a pushback. From Montevideo, Grace Livingston reports. I'm in a wind farm in southern Uruguay, next to an enormous wind turbine. You can hear the blades slicing the air above my head. Uruguay produces more than 90% of its electricity from renewable sources like wind. And I'm with Martin Bocard, who's the president of the Association of Private Electricity Generators here in Uruguay. The private sector has, has really bet on this and invested very heavily on, on this. And you were saying that all the private electricity generating companies, they only produce renewables, is that right? We started investing in first biomass and after later on with wind. Between 2017 and 2020, the proportion of electricity generated from renewable sources reached 97%, one of the highest rates in the world. Recently, that figure has dropped slightly because of a severe drought. But Uruguay still generates far more of its electricity from renewables. That puts the country in a good position to start producing green hydrogen, the government says. As Uruguay's industry and energy minister, Omar Paganini launched the country's ambitious green hydrogen plans. He's now foreign minister. Uruguay has a specific niche because of all this biomass that is waste from agricultural and forestry that combined with hydrogen can be used to make green fuels such as green methanol, green gasoline or, or, or diesel or SAF, sustainable aviation fuel. Latin America has the largest reserves of fresh water per capita in the world, according to the United Nations. So many governments think it makes sense to start exporting hydrogen and fuels derived from water. Hola. But some people, like Ana Maria Barbosa, are worried about the impact on Uruguay's water reserves. She lives in Tambores, a small rural town in northern Uruguay, where the German company Enertrag plans to build a green hydrogen hub, which will include wind and solar farms and a plant producing green hydrogen and methanol. The water here is very pure. It's from a subterranean aquifer. It's a precious local resource. Concerns about water are particularly acute because Uruguay suffered a drought so severe last year that the capital city ran short of fresh drinking water. Mauricio Caro has a small farm about 40 kilometres from Tambores. He says his crops suffered from the lack of rain last year. 
He worries that if water is taken from the local aquifer to make green fuels, farmers will run short. We have a well where we get water for our own consumption and for the farm. But during the drought, the water level fell a lot. We wonder how this will affect us in the future if this company intends to extract water. It's not just us it will affect, but the whole aquifer and the whole region. I put some of these concerns to Enetrag's Griselda Castanino. Uruguay is located on the River Plate Basin. It is 3 million square kilometers. In Uruguay, we have a great availability of water across the whole national territory. The scale of this project is very small compared with the amount of water used by industry or irrigation nationally. Really, this idea that it could cause water shortages, the answer is categorically no. Griselda Casta Nino ending that report from Grace Livingston in Uruguay. Still to come on the Global News podcast. It goes through a part where it will lie on its back and start licking its paw inviting you to tickle its tummy. Could robotic pets help reduce loneliness? The US has called for restraint after Pakistan confirmed it had attacked targets inside Afghanistan. The Afghan Taliban said Pakistani aircraft had, quote, bombed civilian homes, killing eight people. The Pakistani foreign ministry said the airstrikes were aimed at militants who'd launched multiple cross-border raids. The incident comes just a few months after Pakistan exchanged missile fire with another of its neighbours, Iran, though the two have now restored diplomatic relations. For the details on what happened on the Pakistan-Afghan frontier, I spoke to our correspondent, Caroline Davis. We first got an indication that something had happened when the Pakistani Taliban said that there had been this incident overnight. We then heard from the spokesperson for the Taliban government in Afghanistan, who said, yes, that there had been bombing that started around 3 a.m. in two different provinces inside Afghanistan. They said that eight people had been killed, according to them, five women and three children. And in the statement, the spokesperson described this as being a reckless action of violation of Afghanistan's territory. We have now heard from the foreign ministry here in Pakistan. They say this was an intelligence-based anti-terrorist operation. Uh, And the particular group they were targeting, they say, is responsible for multiple different attacks inside Pakistan. But most recently, there was an attack that happened close to the border with Afghanistan, inside Pakistan's side of the border, and seven Pakistani soldiers were killed. So that is what Pakistan is connecting this to. And just take us through how bad the situation is on that uh, Afghan-Pakistan border with the Pakistani authorities blaming militants from Afghanistan for many attacks. Yes, so this has been a consistent point of tension that Pakistan has consistently accused Afghanistan of harbouring militants that then come across from Afghanistan into Pakistan's borders, carry out attacks or plan them from inside Afghanistan and then able to go back across, which makes it more difficult for Pakistan to respond. Afghanistan in response has said that that is not the case. They have said that Pakistan should stop blaming it for their own problems. And we've seen this already sort of spill over in a couple of other different incidents. You might remember that late last year, Pakistan said that all Afghans that didn't have the right legal documentation to stay in the country would be sent back to Afghanistan. That led to outcry from a lot of human rights groups who said that legitimate refugees and asylum seekers were being sent back to Afghanistan before their claims could be properly assessed and they could be relocated somewhere safer. When Pakistan was pushed about why they were doing this, officials would talk about what they said were security concerns. We've seen different occasions where the border between the two has been closed for a period of a few days, even up to sort of a week or so. So there's been real tension between the two governments. And this is just the latest example of it. Caroline Davis in the Pakistani capital, Islamabad. Well, next we bring you two stories from India. One about attacks on foreign students saying Muslim prayers. The other concerning the revoking of visas held by government critics. Are they unconnected or do they tell us something about modern India under the rule of Hindu nationalist Prime Minister Narendra Modi? Our South Asia regional editor Anbarasan Etirajan told me first about the targeting of Muslim students in Mr Modi's home state of Gujarat. 
In the city of Ahmedabad, a group of foreign students were praying late in the night. As you know, this is the holy month of Ramadan. And then suddenly, according to police, a group of people came into the campus and they said they were not supposed to be praying here. They should go to a mosque. And later on, the mob attacked these students and ransacked the rooms. Their mobile phones, laptops and vehicles were damaged. According to police, five people have been arrested. But this created a widespread outage. This is not an isolated incident. A couple of weeks ago, in Delhi, the capital city, a police officer was seen kicking Muslim worshippers. They were praying on the road. This is part of this wider pattern. That is what many people are questioning. OK, and then let's look at those allegations about... Uh action taken against critics of Mr Modi's government. India doesn't allow dual nationality. So what they give is overseas citizen of India status, which allows you to travel any number of times. Now, according to Human Rights Watch, more than 100 people, the government has withdrawn the OCI card status. This is the special privilege of these people who are mostly critical of the government of Mr Modi. Some of the government says they were also involved in protests outside the Indian embassies and high commissions. But there are people who even supported the farmers' protest in India, farmers who were asking for a guaranteed minimum price that produce, and people who are critical of the government's policies. And their special privilege, they were all uh, taken back, which means they cannot go back to India. Now, do these apparently separate stories say something about India today? What the Muslim community leaders would argue is that the number of attacks on Muslims who are a minority in India, even though they are 200 million people, have increased since Mr. Modi took over in 2014 because they point out how the places of worship, businesses of Muslims are being demolished. And they say that the government is using the existing law to target the community. But the BJP, they're saying that there is a well-organized court system where these people can go to the court. On the other hand, if you look into the issue of dissent and criticism, it's not only those who are living abroad, but also within the country. They talk about how the government is, uses laws on like sedition and defamation and anti-terror laws to silence critics even within the countries. But uh, the government of Mr. Modi denies these accusations and they say that they can always approach the courts and India has a very vibrant media where people can take their issues and every day Mr. Modi is being criticised. Our South Asia regional editor Anbarasan Etim Rajan. MPs in The Gambia have voted to revoke a ban on female genital mutilation, paving the way for the removal of legal protections for girls. A clear majority of the National Assembly voted to overturn the ban. The bill will face a final vote in three months' time. Independent MP Almame Jibba told the BBC why he'd introduced the bill to revoke the ban. This practice has done nothing to any woman's body. Instead, it is a cultural norm, it is a religious norm, and this is something that has been performed since pre-colonial era up to date, and people are wholeheartedly willing that this practice should be done. Only five of the Gambia's 58 lawmakers are women, and critics say the move is being imposed on girls by men. Our Africa regional editor, Richard Hamilton, reports. If the proposed legislation passes the final stages, the Gambia will become the first nation in the world to roll back protections against FGM. The bill, introduced by Almama Jibba, said it sought to uphold religious purity and safeguard cultural norms and values. But human rights activists say overturning the ban that was brought in in 2015 is a step backwards that will undo decades of work to end the practice. Amnesty International said it would set a dangerous precedent for women's rights. Richard Hamilton. Over the weekend, thousands of fans created a raucous atmosphere at the Short Track Speed Skating Championships in the Dutch city of Rotterdam. It's one of the fastest sports there is, with competitors hurtling around a tight 111-metre track, shoulder to shoulder, at almost 50 kilometres an hour. Matthew Kenyon was there. Local expectation was huge as the Dutch fans poured into the Ahoy Arena. Skating is massively popular here, but it was a frustrating day as a succession of racers missed out on hoped-for gold. Including Olympic champion Susanna Schulting, who fell in the final of the women's 1,000 metres and wasn't able to complete the rerun race. 
Instead, gold went to Kristen Santos Griswold of the United States, whilst Italy's five-time Olympian and multiple medalist Ariana Fontana, who began her career way back in 2006, took a very unexpected bronze at the end of an exhausting weekend. I heard the whistle when I was like two meters away from the line. I was like, please don't let me do this again. We we're all tired and whoever had the legs at the end was going to win. And we were all pretty much the same. And we started that way, we ended that way. And I'm, I'm still happy with all the races that I've done. How has the sport changed in the many years since you started? I mean, what's oh the God. difference now? <laughs> it is a complete different sport. The time, the way you race, the speed, the, the tactics, it changed a lot. And I'm really glad and blessed that I, I was able to evolve with the sport. There were athletes in Rotterdam from Singapore, from Hong Kong, Mongolia and elsewhere for whom the experience was the thing. Prajwal Sharaf was the only competitor from India, a giant in some sports, but not in short track speed skating. So right now, I'm the only guy, but I think two weeks ago there was a junior world championship. There we had another Indian taking part. Slowly we're growing, but definitely in the coming years, India will also bring a lot of numbers into the world championship and the World Cups. And do you have your eye on the Winter Olympics in a couple of years? That's a very far off question. The coming year in 2025, we have the Asian Winter Games in China. So that's what we're training for. The Netherlands finally got to the top of the podium with victory in the women's 3,000 meters relay. Racers are on the track, their teammates skating inside them, matching their speed before getting a huge shove from behind as they move in to replace them at the changeovers. So what's it like out there on the ice? Well, Canada's individual 500-metre gold medalist Kim Boutin was part of their relay team as well, and she loves it. It's the best. It's a short track, so you have to protect, you have to pass, you have to give everything for your teammates. It's kind of crazy, but it's really fun to do. <laughs> New nations may be coming through as short track tries to spread its appeal, but the winner's roster had in the end a familiar look to it, with China taking three of the four available golds, rounding off an outstanding weekend for them with victory in the men's relay, the last race of three days of enthralling action on the ice in Rotterdam. A report by Matthew Kenyon. Finally. Well, if you thought that was a cat, you'd be virtually right. It is a robo-cat, and it's hoped it could help people feel less lonely. The UK is backing a trial to see whether robotic pets can improve the well-being of elderly people. The BBC's Evan Davis spoke to Lydia Enderby, who's been using robo-pets in a care home since 2018. This is on a cycle at the moment, but what it will do is respond to touch. So as soon as you touch it, it will start oh. purring. It goes through a part where it'll lie on its back and start licking its paw, inviting you to tickle its tummy. You stroked it and that, that it made purred, it yeah. purr. Yeah. You stroke it and it, it, it responds to your touch. <laughs> it's quite sweet. Is the idea to make people feel a little bit less lonely or is it Definitely. able? It is pure company. Does it work, actually? What's... It actually does, yeah. We use it mainly on our dementia units and what it can do is distract from distress behaviours, which you get quite a lot with dementia residents. And it's also a very good reminiscing tool for those people that have had pets in the past. <laughs> Opens conversation and, like with you, it makes yeah. people smile. Yeah. You have a lot of people that you find moving into a care home that would have to get rid of their pet because the landlord in the care home wouldn't allow that. So we do promote pets as therapy, bringing in as many animals as we possibly mm. can. But where that can't happen, this is where this brings in the massive benefits. Well, it's there just you go. Lying on its back. That's it just moved tummy. over. It's asking to be tickled on its tummy. <laughs> is anybody fooled by it? Yes, yeah, some people are. Some people I say, mean, well, that's not real. But they still have fun interacting with it. Other people will just interact with it as a normal cat. What's in the range? We've got three ginger and three grey cats. We have two birds and birds. we have two dogs. It's very nice to have sitting on a shelf and have bird song in the 